The way that ventilation is assessed is by measuring various respiratory volumes. In addition to respiratory volumes, those can be combined to calculate respiratory capacities, which give a view on the person's respiratory status. So these volumes and capacities, they're usually abnormal in people that have some sort of pulmonary disorder. And the way in which this is measured is a spirometer, and that's the original, however cumbersome clinical tool that, was, that is used to measure patients' respiratory volumes. However, now it's measured with a much more efficient, simplistic electronic measuring device. So the volumes that are measured, first is the tidal volume. And this is the normal amount of air that is breathed in and out of the lungs and normally is a half a liter, 500 milliliters. The amount of air that is inspired in addition to the tidal volume is the inspiratory reserve volume. So it's the amount forcibly beyond the tidal volume. Normally 2,100 milliliters to 3,200 milliliters. The amount of air that can be expired forcibly in addition to the tidal volume is the expiratory reserve volume. And there's also an amount of air that always stays in the lungs. And this is important because if we didn't have this air, the alveoli could not remain open. So those are the four volumes and those volumes can be combined for several various other respiratory capacities. And we can see these really well illustrated on the result of a spirometer. So we first see the volumes on the left at the beginning of this graph. And what is happening here first is the patient is breathing in the normal tidal volume. So this is just a normal breath that we see at the beginning of the graph. Then if the patient inhales as much as they possibly can, this is the inspiratory reserve volume. And this would be exhaling everything they can. And the amount of air beyond the tidal volume that they can expire is the 1200 milliliters. And again, there's some air that resides in the lungs that's always in the alveoli, and that is 1,200 milliliters approximately. So the right side of this graph shows the various capacities that can be calculated by adding these various volumes. So we have the inspiratory capacity is the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume. The functional residual capacity is what remains in lungs normally, and that's the expiratory reserve volume, which you can expire forcefully, but you cannot get, your, get rid of the residual volume, the 1,200 milliliters. So the combination of that would be 12, 2,400 milliliters. So the combination of the expiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and inspiratory reserve volume is called the vital capacity. And the total air that is in the lungs and can be, a, uh, the total amount is the total lung capacity. So our next slide shows how each of these are calculated in depth which I've kind of gone over, so be sure to, reserve, to review this table. And the next slide is showing the dead space. And what the dead space is, is it's the amount of air that doesn't contribute to gas exchange. So think about the air that would, would be found in the conducting pathway, the conducting region of the lungs doesn't reach the alveoli so it remains in the passageways and for every 500 milliliters the tidal volume about 150 milliliters of that is called the anatomical dead space however in addition to that there's there could also be dead space if there is non-functional alveoli if they're not able to participate in gas exchange 
This could be due to the collapse or the obstruction of alveoli. So the sum of both of those would be the total dead space, the anatomical dead space, plus the alveolar dead space. So this slide is showing the pulmonary function tests that are done. And they're done for the purpose of determining whether the patient has an obstructive pulmonary disease. And in this case, there is something that is increasing the airway resistance, making it more difficult for air to reach the alveoli. An example of obstructive pulmonary disease would be bronchitis. And in this case, all of these, the total lung capacity, the functional residual capacity, the residual volume may increase because there's hyperinflation of the lungs, trying to overcome that airway resistance. Or a restrictive disease could occur, and this is a reduction in the total lung capacity due to a disease like tuberculosis or fibrosis. And fibrosis could occur, for example, from exposure to asbestos. It could happen from a decreased lung capacity of the thoracic cage. So the tests that measure the rate of gas movement is the forced vital capacity and the forced expiratory volume. And in fact, the forced expiratory volume is measured with the what's called the FEV1, and that's the forced expiratory volume in the first second of expiration. And there's an FEV2 and so on. Now the alveolar ventilation is the total amount of gas that flows into and out of the respiratory tract in one minute. So the normal amount at rest is five to six liters per minute. The normal amount with exercise can increase significantly, kind of like cardiac output can also increase significantly with exercise. So it's a rough estimate of the respiratory efficiency. Now the alveolar ventilation rate is the flow of gases in and out of the alveoli during a particular time. And it's a better indicator of effective ventilation because it takes into account the gases that are reaching the alveolus. So it takes into account the dead space, the tidal volume, the rate of breathing. So the effects of breathing on the body, there's three different scenarios to be aware of. The first scenario is a normal rate of breathing. And in that case, um, you notice the dead space does not change for any of these. It's always a 150 milliliters. And the respiratory rate changes in these situations. The first is the normal rate of breathing, about 10 or 20 breaths per minute. If there's slow, deep breathing, there's half of that, 10 breaths per minute, or rapid, shallow breathing. So in normal breathing, there's about 70% of the effective ventilation for the alveoli. However, in slow, deep breathing, when this is done, it's much more effective and there's more alveoli that, are, that receive the oxygen. But in rapid, shallow breathing, this would be in the case of hyperventilation. There's a very low effective alveolar ventilation rate of 40%, as we see here.